Well, I'm the older one, so I uh, have the honor and the privilege to be with these two great musicians, which I uh, really love for so much. Not so much with him, which is uh, <laughs> the, the young fellow here, and, but he will help me because he knows probably more from my music than myself. He has an enormous list of my pieces which I touch me so much. And uh, going directly to the point, the theme also is honoring me and permits me to talk about the good, the wrong, the bad, and the marvelous. Let's see how we start. I prefer to give the word to my colleagues. Uh, Stephen, for example, and John. So you say, we, we make the dice to start. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to be here to um, try and keep these two in order. Uh, it's nice to be on the stage with two of my all-time guitar heroes. I have to say that because it's true. Um, I'll let you know how the evening's going to go. We're going to discuss amongst ourselves for an hour or so. Then we're going to actually throw the talk open to the floor for you to ask questions to, to Leah or to John. Um, we'll do that for sort of 20 minutes or so at the end, 20 minutes, half an hour. So do think about the questions you might want to ask as we go along. That would be very helpful. We don't want to get to the end and then no one have any questions. Um, and so we're going to sort of spend about an hour or so discussing Leo's work uh, and the context of his work, which of course is, is Cuba and uh, more generally Latin America. And I know that Leo has lots of things to say about that. We thought we'd actually start off by talking about a very recent piece. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Sonata Number no. 5, Ars Combinatoria. Uh, in fact, the guy Andre Lebedev, who played the premier, is in the audience. I saw him earlier. And he's going to be playing it in the concert tomorrow night. But the reason we're starting with this piece is because it kind of sums up where Leo is now with his music and all the different influences that have kind of come into him throughout his long career. Uh, and so we're going to start by talking there and then sort of trace our way back a bit. Latin America, Cuba. Which is the music from us? What do we know about it? Which is the link with Europe? Is the history of seven or eight hundred years from the last period in Europe influencing Latin America? Is uh, there is something from other countries which is amazingly fantastic and extraordinary and strong enough to be influencing? Yes. In my case, the slaves the African slaves, the Negros, in my country are so strong and so unknown in their roots, in their heritage, that I have to talk about this. It influenced me, not the pop music. The pop music is commercial every day more and more and more. And unfortunately, you, as public, enjoys me too. The dancing, the pop world now, which is so nice to, to move your body and so on. It's fantastic, but it's not the music itself. This music, because it's so nice, is taking the place in culture that should be also took by other forms of music from Cuba, from any country, from Latin America. And what happens? Mass media is manipulating you, and me, and him, and everyone. Why? Because they need money from us. And this music is involving everyone because it's so nice to watch. And then there is the image that this is the music from Latin America. And it's not true. It's only one part of it. It's the part that comes uh, supplying the role of culture. And instead of culture, we, in general, we are doing entertainment. And it's happening in Europe, 
is happening in United Kingdom, is happening in all Europe and the whole world. So we don't realize that this is the manipulation of media. But the real music, and then I go back to myself for a second, if my friends permit me, the roots of my music are coming out from ancestors of uh, southern or southern 500 years. And uh, he wants um, a little bit of the, of the fifth sonata for guitar because he realized something which is true. I have in this Ars Combinatoria many, many of my own roots translated into one structure. The sonata form, which is not, uh, is not easy to recognize because I use my way to manipulate sound. But the sonata form is there. And also is there the Fibonacci series, the golden section. And also there are two or three elements of the rhythmical patterns in African rituals from the gods, and so on, so on. But this is not important. It's a pity that we cannot hear that. But maybe we can go around. And uh, we have another musicians in Latin America. I don't know if uh, Gismonti, the Brazilian excellent, marvelous musician, and incredible friend. Uh, we, do we have something from him? I hope, I hope the gods help for the sound. Are you hearing me? Uh, Leo, can you, while, while we're waiting for that, can you, you were just telling us upstairs while we were waiting. Leo was just telling us upstairs while waiting, the story of when you were a child. Well, this anecdotes my first contact with the Cuban heritage of African roots. I was nine years old, and I came dressed in white, totally with, was, was my little only suit in white of the, how you say, prima comunione. First communion. First? First communion. First communion. I, I just already did it, and I was like an angel. <laughs> well, at least I believe so. And then I came to a classical concert of the symphony orchestra. But before arriving, I, I heard the drums of a ritual, a candomblé. And then I stepped. I closed, I, I was paralyzed hearing that marvelous sounds and those voices. And then a, a, a witch of a 200 years old, fat woman in, in white, came outside and said to me, Pasa hermano, common brother, nine years old, 60 or 70. And I came in. Immediately they offered me the most stronger, the strongest rum in the world. My, my tears ran in my face and continues running because then I took a second one. <laughs> and I came directly to the drums. This was my first contact. I don't continue because the science, the science from the African gods protected me, they say, and I was, I got a godfather, Baba Luaye. And so and so. And this happens when I was nine years old. But the most the strongest influence was the sound. This sound. I don't say music, because in that moment, music has another concept. Probably you understand me. For you, music is Mozart, is Haydn, is maybe Stravinsky, I hope so, uh, and Penderecki, and uh, uh, David Bedford. Cornelius Cardio, this gentleman, <laughs> yes? The Briton, of course, and so on. This is my anecdote, and I will never forget it. Okay, shall we hear a little bit of uh, Gizmonti then? And you can yes. talk a little bit about it afterwards. <laughs>
quintet called uh, Ritmos y Danzas. And I am privileged because he dedicated it to me before knowing me personally. Maybe because I was older than him, of course. I'm sorry. He dedicated this piece to me before meeting me personally. And this, uh, this was the period in which he was young, studying uh, with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. Now, I, I, I think that we shall proceed as we were so happy. Yes, are, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I think what's really interesting about the first things that you said, you said that generally the, the image that people have of Latin American music is one of it being sort of popular, commercial, yeah, and yeah. so on, to do with dancing. But for you, the, it's all about uh, ritual, religion, yeah. folk culture, history, and, and a mixture of many things. Yeah. I think one of the things that's, I think, really important about your, your music is the fact that you are a Cuban composer writing Cuban music and not to be mistaken for a European. Uh, yes. And I think many people try and look at your music in a very kind of European way. That's uh, interesting, what he says. Thank you very much. Um, but well, going back... <laughs> yes. this, is, this is true. This is true. You are European. Yes. And your, your, your reference is your culture, obviously. And you mentioned in, uh, in the new sonata that it, it has sonata form, but it's very much distorted and changed through the kind of prism of Latin and different influences. And one of the things I think that's very striking about your music is the, is the stark contrast that you have yeah. that are very uh, kind of un-European. I know in the fourth quartet you have huge long quotations from Bach. It suddenly goes into jazz. It's just, you never know where it's going to turn next. And would you, would you say this kind of... Um, uh, Plurality is very much a, a Latin thing. I think so. I think uh, uh, Latin American, especially the, 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 the music that comes out from the African rhythms or small melodies or small things. I like more than a whole long quotation on uh, African music. I prefer the short cells. These short cells, I used to call them, as Umberto Eco used to do, estilemas. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a reference in a, in a small section of the, of the totality of, of one idea, and so on, so it's, it's not so complicated. Uh, can you hear me well now? More or less. <clears throat> well, I try to be a, a kind of Pavarotti. Um, you know, the problems in Latin America, I, I did something a little bit in, in, in fun, no? I, I say, Europe versus Latin America. It's not true, but anyway, it provokes. Our culture in, is European in, in the roots, at, at least in the 50% or 75%. The, the, the heritage that is influencing us, the authentic music from each region, African or proper from the Indians, the so-called Indians in America, are not handled as, uh, as, as roots or heritage. They are manipulated by the mass media. Once more, I talk about it. Many Europeans, the common man, think that we are not enough involved in this enormous amount of history of Europe, which is the, the, the enormous history is true, but we are involved in a certain way. But uh, we also have some other rules, like I told you about the African uh, slaves in the first place, with a couple of thousand years old uh, content, or what is mature for so many years in this uh, culture is really mature, it's not only mature, it's so strong and so powerful that history is not distorting it. Not even history, but even the Manipulators are not, are, for them it's impossible to distort these roots. 
and they take the most elemental and uh, easy way for the dancing and for the pop musician, which is uh, also involved with this richness. Which richness? The pop world for dancing today. So it's very true that your, your music draws on this long history, cultural history in South America, um, particularly aspects of religion and mixture of the sort of uh, Latin religions and also Catholicism, the traditional religions. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of this kind of ritual material in your work and also folkloric material that yes. sort of goes yes. back, back a long way. Back. Would you like to say something about why those things are important to you? Well, um, when I was a child also, my, my family or my families were involved in, in pop music. Uh, in a gentle way, I'm talking about 50 years ago, minimum, when the songs were and the dances were gentle, were nice, were beautiful, not aggressive or so, whatever. But this was, this was not in, uh, uh, touching me. What touched me once, and I remember it when I was five years old, is that I put my ear in the, in the wood of the, and the wood of pianoforte. I put my ear and I hear this enormous sound that makes something like electronic, electroacoustic music and so. And this is, for me, was so, I was so pleased with us, much more than the normal radio music I was hearing. That's, that's really interesting. Sorry to interrupt at that point, but the kind of really visceral aspect of music, the sort of physical effect that the, that's it. the ritualistic stuff had on you, is that's the thing that seems to make more of an impression on you than, for example, melodies and harmonies. Of course, but not only that, the structure of sound, uh, this, this, let's call it noise, this noise was touching me much stronger than the organized music in itself, as we call it. And, and when you went to America and you studied at Juilliard and the Hart College and you were introduced to the European avant-garde, yes. was this more sort of in tune with this way of thinking? Absolutely. When I started uh, 12 years old hearing the re radio, because I didn't got enough money to go to the conservatory, and my teacher was a radio, a radio classics, the one that makes me an impact was the Rite of Spring by... Stravinsky or the string quartets by Bartok. Why? I don't know. I heard many, I heard more than 500 pieces there and I did an analysis on my papers, oral analysis. Now this is supposed to be an introduction. No, now comes another, this should be a second idea. Pro probably he will develop and so on, so on, so on. Now, sorry to interrupt again, but that's a really interesting parallel because the Rite of Spring you mentioned, is full of that kind of faux ritualistic stuff from a kind of imagined Absolutely. Russian uh, ritual, uh, ritual, which is very similar to what you were describing about when you had your first communion at yeah. the age of nine. And in fact, you can hear those sort of Stravinsky and repeated patterns in much of your music. In fact, in the fourth string quartet, it almost sounds like the sacrificial dance. Of Sometimes, um, maybe you can get it out of this magical box. Yeah, wonderful opening. I think what's really interesting about that piece is that later on, suddenly it just goes in and quotes a large section from the slow movement of the Bach double concerto, mm -hmm. and that's immediately followed by a kind of jazz jam. Yes. 
Uh, I recommend you check it out. It's a 13-minute, one-movement string quartet, string quartet number four from 2007. But rather like the Ars Combinatoria piece we were talking about earlier, it kind of really sums up this combination of styles and influences that you've, you've got to in your kind of mature work. Well, this also, this belongs to a certain moment in which, in which I extend in, the, in, in time. I started doing it in 67 with a piece which is called Tradition is Broken, but it's a hard job for symphony orchestra. And, uh, and 67, 69, and then this is 2007, no? Seven. Yeah, it's about, yeah. And uh, why? There is, there is a jump in time, but not in meaning. So the whole music, this crazy, elements together, these uh, crazy elements together, are joined like sisters and brothers or whatever, or lovers. And you see, they, they have nothing to do. Bach and double concerto, uh, jazz improvisation, African music, they have a link which is secret there. They are re uh, uh, tonal, re tonal or non-tonal anyway, relationship with intervals, intervals, which are only stilemas. They are only syllabus. How is this? Syllables. In John. language, in language, any language, it, uh, English, Italian, Spanish, the syllable is, is just the beginning of something that we call a word, una palabra. The African origin there are linked by not only the syllable, but by re tonal relationships, let's call tonal, re I call them properly actual notes, actual points of, of departure. Leo, I'm interrupting you. Yeah, <laughs> please. We have to, otherwise it. it's going to go on all night. No, it's very interesting to say, because one of the things I was uh, reading that you said uh, that I hadn't heard you say before was uh, the, uh, listening to music, you would, uh, you, 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 you want and you hope that, uh, that when listening to your music, one is waiting for the next thing, uh -huh. always. Well, it sounds obvious, but it's not so obvious, isn't it? Because uh, often when you hear quotes of well-known pieces, you know, it can be, and often is, a bit of a gimmick. You know, people do it, oh, oh I read this a little, you know, I recognize that bit of, it could be Bach or something. Yeah, cool. But the extraordinary thing about hearing that in that quartet uh, is that, I listen to it without having read the notes. Usually, I, it, 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 I've got the notes in front of me, and then, you know. And yes. I didn't think to myself, oh, stuck a bit of bark in there, a bit of jazz in there. Because, as you were saying before when we were talking, it's that moment when you get there, you, you, there is a moment for the composer or the listener when you're wondering, what is coming next? Yeah. yeah. But and you have no preconceived idea. And if it comes <clears throat> as part of a uh, sort of, Recurring passage of something from. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. it, it, uh, because I'm not working structurally. I'm working music sensorial with epidermic element coming in. But not only that, every one of you, everyone from us, has different flashbacks, moments reflections which are entirely far away from, from the specific moment which are, you are living. Now, oh God, you are playing, you are rehearsing, you are warming hands. Oh, I forgot to, to, to put out the, the oven. It's going to explode. And you put the oven and you continue and then, ah, I have to call my lover. But you are studying music, why are you? This is the flashback that comes because memory acts in many different levels all together. And this is what I do also. This is really... I, 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 I discovered one little secret, but it's not important. This, this is absolutely fascinating because what you're telling us here is this, this notion of a kind of spontaneous flashback and that you're using quotations and references because they occur to you at the time quite spontaneously. Yeah, rather. rather than a kind of European approach would be to try and be clever, clever about it and put it in a kind of uh, intellectual context. There, there's a kind of um, freedom. You have the freedom to go anywhere. Yeah. 
Um, and I think in many of your pieces, I was just thinking about the Beethoven quote in the first sonata. You know, people yes. often say in a lesson, why is it here? And I say, well, probably because he just felt like it. Yeah. So did you just feel like yeah. it? Oh, of course, and not only. I, 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 in the first sonata I dedicated to Julian, uh, the Beethoven's uh, quotations starts and ends in the actual notes of my sonata. Yeah. And then I connect them with the first and last notes of my sound. Also. So they have a, a kind of continuity because I want to get a little bit of the talent of the genius. So I put them together so I can take something from Beethoven or Soler or whatever. <laughs> but you say it also, you, you mentioned these molecules, these musical molecules, which you mentioned as being intervals or motifs. Yeah. So it's almost as if you're writing music and suddenly your music will remind you of something else. Ah, that's it. And you'll put it in. That's it. That's another. A, a Is this covering all my secrets? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce a slightly different uh, tack. Slightly yes, different yes. sort of thing here. Yes. Uh, thing about European music yeah. since a thousand years, roughly, is it's, the harmonies all developed on from church harmony until the deconstruction of the 20th century. So it's very limited by that. You, you, you can't have all that counterpoint yeah, within the string quartet, within the wind quintet, with, yeah. even in a Brahms symphony. You've still got the same soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Yes, yes, yes. And all the music is based on that. So, you know, it, by taking music, which has lived from before that time through, it, it has an internal quality. The little cells that you take have Bravo. an internal quality. I think so, thank you. And we must remember, uh, I think, I'm interested to see how you react to this, is that actually the, the European uh, format is actually only one of many it's come to dominate music, and it, in the entertainment sense, that commercial sense that you were referring to, it has colonized the world. You know, it's, if, if, if you go to China, if you go to, it, it, it's it, this, this Western simplification Influence. of, it is. You find so it there. Very, and, it, and it seems that the Latin American, not just Cuban, but uh, you know, um, throughout yes. the rest of South America and Central America, there's still a lot of living music, which, from, from, from my hopes and things, to carry us through, which is not going to be dictated to by this European diktat. Yeah. yeah. Well, How do you respond it, to it's, that? It's hard to, to express in, 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 in small amount of time. Yeah. But you're right on this. Also, also when composers are sitting to compose or whatever, or thinking about how music goes on. Always we have some interruption of the commercial element in our life and we don't know it. Because we, sometimes we rejected, you rejected because you are concentrated on something, but the radio is there smashing and fighting. And if not the radio, the TV. If not the TV, the, the, the internet. So you have always a possibility of being manipulated by the media. And that's why you try to ignore it. But this is not true. You don't know that this goes directly to your living internet, um, brain computer. This is a living computer, the most marvelous one. You try to ignore the thing and this thing goes in. And after 50 years, you hear some commercial, a bad word, but some commercial shit. <laughs> and then you like it. You like it. But and you are not able to discriminate the quality from the awful, the good from the bad, the beautiful from the ugly. That is happening now. That's very profound. I mean, I think you mentioned Umberto Eco earlier on the whole idea of the, the syllable as, as the unit. And of course, what Eco uh, put forward was the idea that we no longer have a tree of knowledge, but we're kind of stuck in this labyrinth with these kind of random turns at every corner. Yeah. And his model of the world is sort of based on this, and it's exactly what you're describing, this world of total interruption of many, many influences, many things. And there's an interesting link with Latin America, because he was very much influenced by Borges. Yeah. And, um, and it's just a very different way of looking at things, so that you're looking at a discontinuity 
yeah. rather than a sort of yes, European the, romantic the, the continuity. classical uh, uh, element of continuity. Yeah. Yeah. The, the contemporary world is discontinuous always. And also, in my music, it, this element or this uh, 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 real powerful idea for creating is always there. Always. And oh, another little secret, it's no secret, but... It's I a secret, you better hold your microphone, I, please. I compose like chatting with you, or discussing, or thinking about, and some, sometimes you stop your thinking, and then you go back, as I told you a few minutes ago, and sometimes you come back, it's not a rondo form, but you come back. And this is the human brain, which is a treasure we have to keep clean as much as possible. Well, do you think um, that when you're composing, the piece could come out many, many, many different ways? Yes. And the, and the version that you end up on paper is just one of perhaps thousands of potential pieces. Absolutely. This is my great problem now. That's not a problem. I have, well, I have, uh, I'm composing, I have I have to follow, to continue, and I have 10 or 15 ways to do it. What a pity, I have to take 14 out. This is a problem when I'm getting older, more ideas and more ideas. Maybe it's the only thing I have now. <laughs> People normally complain they don't have enough ideas, so I would... Uh... <laughs> um, Leo, when you work with performers, like when you've worked with, with John in the past, um, to what extent do you um, mold your music or to the person you're writing for, or do you just simply write music? No, no, I, 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 can't, I, I, sh I should be, and I was, and I still want to be, a biographer. A biographer? About the performer, yes. I wrote Toronto's concerto for John Williams. And even I try to break his fingers, impossible. <laughs> and I wrote the first uh, sonata for Julian, which, uh, or the elegiaco, he asked me for. You know the story of the elegiaco? Can I take two minutes? Yeah. You know, uh, the, the senior producer of BBC London was Gareth Walters, magnificent, extraordinary guy. And uh, one day, Julian called me, called him. Hey, Gareth, it's me, Julian, how are you? And then, oh, hello, what up? You know, I heard a music in, the, in Radio Netherland, a violin concerto by this kind of Leo Brower. Is he the same guy that writes music for guitar? Is he? Yes, of course. Da, 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 da. Oh. What happened? I like his violin concerto. And then Gareth says, if you like it, why don't you ask him a piece for you? Hmm, it's a good idea. <laughs> okay, Gareth, let's see. How can we manage? And then they say, well, uh, BBC commissioned a piece. You played. Good. Finito. And then I wrote a biography. Elegiaco is Hypochondria, <laughs> Elegiaco is tender, is aggressive here, is nostalgic there. This is, this is Julian. <laughs> so you're a biographer? <laughs> <laughs> with, with the performers, with the good performers? Yeah. Uh, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, and many things like that. Sometimes, why I put them Elegiaco? because, in a way, his melancholic character is, was dominating in certain moments of his life. Uh, and uh, was very, very touching me, very much. Leo, I'm going to ask you a very difficult question for you to answer. Maybe Steve may help out here. But why do you think that of all the different cultures of Latin America, Central Latin America, Cuba, we know, you. 
why has uh, there been no other really substantial composer, certainly for the guitar, and uh, of, I would say, of your, we hate measuring things, say, best or stature, but certainly. Like in school. Yeah, no, seriously, in my seriously. opinion, that has it. Certainly, as, as a subsidiary from the guitar point of view, absolutely not. Um, except for one or two works, very, very little else anywhere. Yeah, we, we are not talking about the great masters of the past like Mangori, Barrios Mangori, who was a, a late romantic because his country was not permitting a, a huge development of, of historical um, uh, art coming into contemporary life. He, he was not hearing anything, he was not developing anything. The books were not published ta -ta 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 in Paraguay. And that's why he started as a romantic of 19th century. But what a genius to write good music, even late. But we are not talking about him. The problem is, the problem is that Latin, in general, Latin American composers and Cuban composers think that this flavor is good enough to be inserted in music, in this case. So the flavor of the dance, the bossa nova, this, and even some European composers were, were enchanted by some of these marvelous pop musics. Some, like uh, Roland Dion, for example, he, he, he was in love with Brazilian bossa nova and um, so, and uh, he was, he has a good taste not to go further into the cliches, but the cliche was there menacing, <laughs> always. And the rest, they don't want to be millionaires with pop music, because then they go to the actual rap or whatever, and they develop that. They want to do serious music, and the, the false idea is very simple. If I take my roots, my uh, thematical cells, my uh, music which is identified perfectly, and I put it into the symphonic world, then I, I put and I enrich these popular cells, this popular language. It's not true. You are not enriching anything. You are distorting and disguised the sound and you are taking something which is perfectly naked, and then you put clothes on, and it's a disaster. Mm. And this is happening. That's a really interesting uh, observation. I mean, I think, so what you're saying basically is that it's very easy to be influenced by the sound of a style of music of rather than the content. Yeah. Uh, and what you're doing is you're deconstructing things down to their smallest elements and putting something together that draws on elements from many different things and they put in contrast to one another, mm -hmm. rather than simply saying, okay, this movement will be a blues yeah. or this movement will be a bossa yeah. nova. Yeah. Exactly, but, but, but Leo, ideally, should be the model or example yeah. for other composers and other, I mean, if you listen to the traditional musics from the, we have had in, in the past here, wonderful series, uh, World, World Roots, um, uh, Lucy Duran, Oh. Does that name mean anything to you? Yeah, it's familiar. Yeah, yeah. and she yeah. travelled all over with yes, doing yes. programmes on, on, on the, 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 uh, the music of like, Panama, Belize, all the Mexico, but places that you would never, if you heard that music, you would, you would, uh, most people would say, well, where the hell is that from? And it's fantastic. But so far, maybe with <laughs> your example, uh, no, I, I, no, no people have taken cells from that music in a, in, a, in a creative way, in the way that you have? Well, let's, let's go to the real problem. Latin American orchestras, Latin American musicians and performers are dreaming, dreaming, I repeat the word, with the Metropolitan Opera House, with La Fenice in Venice, with the Albert Hall, with the, the Wigmore Hall, with the Teatro Colón from Buenos Aires. Their dream is to go there and to come into Germany, to, to Berlin and, and do Beethoven. My goodness, 
They are crazy. Are you going to play Beethoven in Berlin with the Berlin Philharmonic? It's silly, absolutely silly. And this is happening always. And not only there, in Europe, your big orchestras are repeating once, twice, thrice, all the time, the same Beethoven, marvelous, the same Mozart a genius, the same uh, uh, Rachmaninoff. I'm sorry, I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. It's not a critic. It's the truth. What, what a problem. Stravinsky, this is a Martian or, or Venus. This is from another planet. And it's a classical. The Rat of Spring is more than 100 years old. And this is happening. How many works from him are played? And he is lucky that he is a good composer and is played. But how many works, strong works, big works, chamber pieces, solo pieces, are played in the big halls? Mine also, or any other composer, but even composers with such, a, such a, an equipment and history. Tippett is not as well played as it should be, or, or Maxwell Davies, or whatever. And they are 60, 70 years old, 80 years old, or dead already. Anyway, this is the problem that, uh, it, stop. Well, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem with certain aspects of the music profession. Orchestras, yes, orchestral series, yes. Violin repertoire, cello repertoire, cello repertoire, uh, piano and voice. Those repertoires are kind of calcified between Bach and Rachmaninoff. <laughs> and it's very hard for anything new to get in. But I think in the guitar world, um, we're very lucky because new music gets in a lot. I mean, your yeah. first sonata is only <coughs> 27 years old, and yet it feels like an old war horse. <laughs> I can't imagine a piece of the piano repertoire that new feeling like a kind of standard yeah, repertoire piece. Yeah. So I, so, sometimes, you know, in, in movements of, of, I suppose, in any culture, but in, in composition, certainly, there are sort of fashions that go in, like, like the 60s, avant-garde or whatever, you know. And uh, I mean, my wife and I, well, I'm not going to mention the piece, but we heard a, a premiere of a, of a new piece about three years ago at the Albert Hall. Uh, and it was followed by a piece from the 20s by Varese. Mm. And the Varese, it was this very interesting, this the Varese piece sounded really new and exciting. Yes. And the piece we'd just heard, which was the first performance, with all the modern gimmicks, sounded so old fashioned. Because it was like, it was like, it, I mean, it sounded like 60s music. You know, whereas the Varese was, let, let, let's use it, was eternal, like your Stravinsky, you're saying, it's right of spring, you know, it's, so it's, uh, but it's a problem with the, with the Latin American composers, apart from the, they yes. haven't, you know, the, from the different countries, is that, were you implying or saying that they, because they're looking to Europe, they're looking to the big European That's performance, it. yes, it's exactly, which is one, yeah. yeah. But I mean, they must. It, it's 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 terrible because the the, the raw material, the yes. cells, yes. if you like, yes. you know, is there. Yes. It's in uh, yes. just not being. I I don't know if maybe we refresh the theoretical world with some sounds. Uh, Yeah. 
This is one, one of the dances. Uh, oh, yes. I don't remember the, 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 the dance. I don't remember if it's the second. Oh, Dance of the Ancestors. Second volume of, of da Danzas Rituales y Festivas. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an homage to Ravel valses, nobles y sentimentales. So we're sort of uh, moving on to the time where we're going to start opening it up for yes. questions. But yeah. uh, first, I just want to say, uh, ask you a couple of very small things. One is that you often reuse ideas from one piece to another piece. Yeah. 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 Uh, again, this is a very non-European approach. Uh, well, I say non-European, but it's something that Bach did, it's something that Vivaldi did, the previous composers. Um, and Sometimes I know that people have been critical of this kind of approach of taking material and reusing it. But, um, of course, many, many composers do this. And um, what, would you, what would you say about it in your defense? Yeah, I know that this is in the 20th century Fox, uh, 20th century, 20th century, not Fox. This is British, uh, American uh, film. It's easy to explain. If Bach transcribed, if Beethoven transcribed his violin concerto to the pianoforte, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Beethoven transcribed his violin concerto, he did it, he did it for piano. But it sounds, it's interesting. And uh, Bach took many, many things from his cantatas and translate them, tra or transpose them into other new pieces. The same piece entirely. And not only one, Telemann also did, and many, many, many composers. Many composers, I'm sorry, did this. Telemann is another one of them in, in, in quoting himself or using his, his own themes. I used to do it now because some of the orchestral pieces and some materials from a string quartet, for example, or whatever, are interesting enough and could be heard in different moods. And there is this, now it's also, don't forget that many, many classicals are transcribed. From wind quintet into strings, the string quartet into, into full orchestra, and so on, so. This is something that is normal now. And sometimes the music is heard in a different color. You, re you recognize the music, but the color is given a new dress or a new um, profile for these sounds. And this is nice also to get, well, it sounds well. The, the, the Puritanismo, thinks in other way, thinks that there's only one version. And uh, I, are, I accept this in terms of color, but don't forget that Baroque, for example, is using a continuum. For example, there is a famous guitar piece, Giacona in D from Bach, from one of the suites, uh, Partitas. The original is violin and is transcribed for many instruments and well transcribed. Brahms did one, Schumann did another one, Stokowski did another one, Ferruccio Busoni did the piano athletic version, and so. 
And, and Segovia did one we criticized when I was a purist, puritanismo uh, in, inside me. I said, no, he's the, but then I study early music. I specialize in early music, and then I discover that it's something we call basso continuo, which is done by a group like in jazz. The harpsichord, the tiorba, the violoncello, uh, gamba, all these forms a harmony to fill the gaps of the contrapoint. Why Segovia is, go, is, is so crazy that he just filled some gaps in the harmony. It's not my favorite Segovia because he was uh, very special. But, uh, but, but it was a genius in color, really. Le Le the, it, see, the, the business of repeating uh, the cells that you do, has yeah. never, like, we both know that some people criticize it or, or wonder what's doing it. It never occurred to me because I think what that criticism comes from is a, is a, is a mis, uh, misinterpretation yeah. of what music is about because a composer has a style and experience which he's no. trans, he or her, is transmitting through the music. And That's certain it. things are important. With Rachmaninoff, certain modulations of harmony come in time and time and again in every piece. Yes. Using the the the, uh, the, the interrupted cadence. The. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of musicians here who knows what an interrupted cadence. In other words, it yes. comes to an end, but it's a it's a it's a chord that's quite sad. <laughs> for example, let's just say that. You know, often yeah. with Rachmaninoff, it's very sentimental in that way. So those are also no less repetitions. I think it comes from a, an idea that, that everything, every note that every composer has to do has to be totally original, individual, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, no, it, perfect. It's, it's a yeah. cultural attitude, yes. which is totally misses the point. You yeah, know? Yeah. And, and that's why, like in your music or in anyone's music, yeah. to hear a motive repeated coming up, it's a delight. <laughs> you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. It yeah. comes often in yours. Yes, Every time yes. I, I hear, you know, Leo's got a new piece or something, and I hear it, and it comes in, I say, oh, that one again. You know? Yes, one, <laughs> once more. Yeah, yeah, yeah once because, more. Because that moment makes it special. Yeah, so, yes, yeah. it is true. And it's also a motto. Like, uh, for example, Hitchcock yeah. used to come as an actor in the third level, and he comes through the... the, 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 the in the picture. The picture. What about? And Tiri uh, Tariri, and then somebody in my country called me Tiri Tarititi. And here, here comes Tiri Tarititi. And uh, hello, how are you? Tiri Tarititi, Tiri Tarititi. In, in the, um, the Cameron Negra, in the last movement, yeah. th there is, a, there is, there is a, a statement of that. It's, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's the theme of the, all the way through. All the but way through. When you come back to the main part of this tune, it comes almost when you least expect it. And it stops everything before you get the lovely tune back. You know, it suddenly goes, you know, it, it, it sends yeah. a shiver down my spine when I get to it, you know? It's all the way through the movement, isn't it? Da -da 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 -da. And then suddenly in a key, it's actually an A, but it, you don't expect, da 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 <laughs> like this. You know, so, yeah. there you are. And it's something. It's something, yes. It's, it's, the, it's, too, it's like the person who, plays with language. He was quoting Jorge Luis Borges, the great, one of the greatest uh, poets in, 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 uh, in Spanish, in, in uh, Castilian, Castellano, which is the real name of it. Not Spanish because Sp Spain has three, four, five hundred of ways to speak. Anyway, I don't want to <laughs> bore you. I think it's time enough. Yeah. If you want to kill one of us, I prefer to be the victim. But before we hand it because over... Because these people are so valuable. <laughs> before we hand it over to the audience, there's one, one final observation I'd like to make. Something you've said before is that you, you, when you got involved in the avant-garde and in atonality, aleatoric music, you found a, a dissatisfaction because there was no tension between a kind of um, statement, counter-statement, or contrast. Um, and would you say now that your music is really defined by contrast? 
Do you think that's its? But main... this is one of the of the aspects of the avant-garde period. The the worst is that the avant-garde period is uh, av avoiding to rest, mm. and the great Achilles' wheel from avant-garde period is that the, it never stops tension. The tension through intervals, called so-called dissonant, and tension in the way to prepare the, the discourse, the, 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 the speech of the music in itself. And uh, my discussion with some colleagues when I was very young, later I don't discuss with masters like that, but I got discussions, and they were indefinite, with, with Pierre Brulez, uh, with um, discussions pro and contra also, like friends. I became, I was lucky to become friend of many people like Morton Feldman, like uh, Cornelius Cardio by, by uh, letters with uh, Morton, with uh, Donatoni, with uh, Silvano Buzzotti, with uh, Earl Brown. Uh, Takemitsu was a beloved friend, Japanese genius. And uh, always the theme was the same, why? the avant-garde, lovely, aggressive, marvelous, crazy period, never rest. If you think that everything is a contrast, day, night, man, woman, yin and yang, sun, moon, the breathing, everything has this contrast and rest. If you don't sleep at night, you die. If you don't sleep at night, you die. <laughs> so, some night you should sleep also. Yes. Right, let's, shall we open it up? Uh, so, questions. I, I suspect what will happen is that everyone will be really scared to ask the first question, then we'll get a sort of sudden flood of questions when it's time to go. Ah, oh, hands up. Is that Emmanuel? Yeah. Oh, sorry, before, before we do the questions, can you speak slowly and, and loud. clearly and loudly? <laughs> um, just wondering, because both of you have been very involved with Latin American music here in Europe, what has been your perception of how it's been received, either from the performer's point of view or as a composer? How have these attitudes uh, started, transformed, where do you see them nowadays? It's very difficult for me to hear clearly. No. Uh, yes, I think I heard, I think it's... Uh, where, where do we uh, have we found the response to what we both do, what you write, what I what do you play and, and, uh, in Europe? How do we find the response to that Latin American? I don't know. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, 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 mainly, you're talking about classical contemporary composers like me, for example. Your work. Oh, my work in, in particular. Uh, I, I found in general. A, a very good, uh, welcoming, uh, I don't know why, because it's not an easy music, or of course, there is something which I attend carefully, which is the relationship of balance in harmony. No piano. It's a pity, it's a pity. Because the interval, let's say, the syllable in sound, when you organize them, in phrases, when these phrases belong to a paragraph, and so on, so on, so on. This is one of the most important elements, which is called equilibrium. If you, if, if you take a banal chord, from, mainly from pop music, that's why I need an, an instrument, I don't have it. And I don't want to be rhetoric, <coughs> saying in terribles, and, which is an abstraction, they should sound. There is a chord which is banal, even ridiculous. But they, they, they are nice, they are pretty. They are pretty. I say on purpose, pretty. <laughs> they are not beautiful. Because they, con they, they, they change into banality. And this, this type of chord with seventh added dot, 
di di da 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 di di di. Oh my God, please, no more. No more of this. Why is banal? Because there is no equilibrium between the syllables. Do mi, consonant. Mi so, consonant. Sol si, consonant. Do si, one dissonant. One against three, impossible. Finito. No, con no balance. The same happens with a polychord of 12 notes from Schoenberg. If you put it in this way, or this way, or this way, the sound changes. If you take the same banal chord and you dispose the intervals, try to do it if you are a musician. Take the intervals and change the character of it. Put a fourth and a fifth, you have the same count. And it's clean, marvelously contemporary. It doesn't sound banal. Yeah? This is balance. And this, I use it all my life since I was a kid. I don't know why. Because, and I don't know why I found this stupid chord banal, because it's, it's used in millions of songs, millions, not thousands. But these songs are banal also. I, I just, a uh, dancer as, as, a, as, a, as a player, <laughs> um, I, I, a few years ago, I did a, a tour around England with the Volos Concerto. Oh. That's the fifth. I, 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 uh, Volos, which is six. Six, 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 six concerto. Volos, yeah. There is something there from Volos? No. I, I don't, oh, yeah, know, I don't think I have Volos. No. Anyway, I did. Uh, so I, because of the nature of the variety of concerts I do, I, I'm, I try to actually compromise a little bit. I, I hope for the best reasons. Uh, with some of the commercial side that Leo was talking about earlier on, because as long as one keeps one's honesty, it's a necessity mm. if you're going to communicate. You know? Yes. Uh, so, I, for example, I wouldn't do a tour around England to in, in large halls with the first concerto, yes. which is a, a 60s aleatoric, very. Uh, if you're interested in Leo, it was a fantastic piece to do when I when I did it. But the Volos is very. Uh, it's everything, actually. Yes, it? yes. It, it's yes. like I it's, what you it's mean. original, and it's very. So, um, but on the other hand, if you're playing solos by someone like Barrios Mangore, it's very easy for people. It, it 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 doesn't it doesn't take any cultural leap for them because it's as Leo was saying, it's 19th century music in its harmony and its yes. style. So that's. But so well done. So as a as a performer, one's more in a compromised position than as. a as a composer, you know, yeah. when, when you do something like, I mean, I played the Camera Negro, I was playing, I must have played it in nearly every concert for about eight years, <laughs> you know, because it's a great piece, but it's also a great bridge for sometimes ordinary people who often haven't heard any classical music at all. Yes, it's, you it's know? true, it is true. So, you know, it's, it's a compromised situation and you do your best to, is that the sort of thing you like? <laughs> okay, what do you have there? Do you have volos?
Another question. Ah, in the middle front there. So yeah. Your um, concertos of just one aspect of what we did, your concertos and your string quartets, for example, um, standing from where you are now after all these years, how do you look back on your legacy of these pieces? It, 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 this is very funny because <coughs> some of my music. <coughs> Some of my early pieces, I, I put it out. Even I burned some, uh, and now I like them. And I find very interesting things in there, which I forgot, I really forgot that these ideas were mine, and I used them 50 years ago. I forgot it. See, so look, but I have now this piece, wrote it last year, and this cells and this procedure is from my piece in the 1978, when I was 19 years old or something like that. Uh, but I am always cutting. I compose and then I start cutting and reducing and making a compact idea. That's what I do now. I, do, I shouldn't say, but it's true. Thank you. <coughs> Why? Because Manuel de Falla said once, and composers should hear this. He said, to compose is easy. This is true. Composing is easy. True. What is difficult is to take out the unnecessary music. So I, I do it. Sometimes I have a piece of 10 minutes, and then I let three. The other seven goes to burn. But later I realized that the other seven got something, so I keep it in the drawer. And sometimes I read this and say, this is not bad at all, but uh, not now. But boom, once more to the drawer. But I don't burn that now. And I'm too old for being so rude with my own music. <laughs> Another question, please. Sometimes when I talk about uh, 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 giving concerts, I, I will, because I talk too much sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> I will say there is an awkward aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean to say that giving the concert is awkward. No, no, no. I'm yeah. not actually, I Because what I've often said is that playing solo, uh -huh. if you're enjoying it, you might as well enjoy it at home. Uh -huh. You see what I mean? It's a, but it doesn't mean to say that you don't enjoy it doing the concert. You do, of course. You know, guitar sounding in a big hall, yeah, it's very exciting it sort of thing. But in terms of the music, you, you could be playing it at home if you love the music. So, you know, sometimes I try and explain that dichotomy, that's all. And, and something else, there is something else there. The concert halls, the symphony orchestras, the conductors are playing the same thing, in the same way. Overture, a concerto, a famous one, let's say, piano concerto, Rachmaninoff, with a star. Yes, the star should be there playing, and then the symphony. Once, twice, and hundred times the same. This is what he tries to say also, and I say so. Rachmaninoff is a genius. Beethoven also. Bach, don't say anything about him. I tremble. But, but, but I know by me. You know, Rubinstein, somebody remember the name and the way to play piano 
by Arthur Rubinstein. Yes or no? Yes? Okay. You know Paul Casals? Yes. Okay. okay. Rubinstein was a friend of both were friends, like we are, really close friends. And Rubinstein arrived to say hello to Casals and say, and then he was preparing another recital. And he was hearing and he said, but Paul, are you crazy? Are you playing, uh, Paul, are you crazy? Are you still playing the six suites for cello solo by Bach all together in one program? The people will kill you. You know, when was this? This happens in 1935, not now. And it's true. To do a, a, a chronological order is not nice. Everybody you knows from Renaissance and a little Baroque, some 19th century, some contemporary, very soft and delicate or fantastic, like uh, genius, genius, all are genius. Hal Benis or Granado Baravatis. And maybe a little tiny contemporary, boom. And then <laughs> this is what happened. If the symphony orchestra goes once more, the overture, the, the soloist, sometimes you go to hear the solo because the soloist is fantastic. And that's it. And sometimes you are going to hear music. And I, I change so much that I want to hear new music. But new music doesn't mean that it's 21st century. There are some marvelous things. Like, for example, our friend from, uh, uh, from Cervantes Institute creates this series of Guitarissimo years ago. But he's a, a fan of music. And he discovered me, I discovered through him, a fantastic unknown composer in the Baroque, in the German Baroque scenery, Erlebach. Fantastic composer. Nobody plays it. Everybody plays Bach and Bach. And sometimes Telemann and of course a lot of Handel. And I, I say bravo because Handel wrote uh, so much for countertenors. Countertenors, what is this? Oh, the man that looks like a woman. No, not exactly so. They are voices, marvelous voices. But nobody knows it because everybody wants the bel canto. Maria Callas number three, four, five, six. Placio Domingo number seven, eight, nine, ten. Enough of the speech. Another question. Yeah. Half of it, I can't hear. Is there a kind of guitar sound that, that you prefer? To, oh. Is that right? Yeah. Or a make, make of guitar type of make guitar? Make of guitar, kind of guitar? Is well, it? look, if you talk about a, 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 a beautiful, powerful, beautiful instrument, or, or for example, electric guitar, or, or everything together. He means the guitar you play. You, you Just the classical. Guitar, you oh. play. The one I played, yeah. I, I prefer, I got many, many, many years a Kono, a Japanese, which at the beginning I didn't like, but with, the, with time, the instrument get mature, the wood get a little more, more uh, beautiful in, in general. His technique was almost perfect, almost. And then later I found a Spanish from Granada, Marin. And Marin is uh, getting everything together. Perfection, easy, easy uh, tastiera, uh, and, uh, and, and resonance, and, and some powerful elements, and a balance between the harmonics and non-harmonic uh, sounds. 
which is very difficult. So, and also I, I got a Friedrich years ago with whom I, I did two of my Deutsche Grammophon records with that, and I did two with a, an old, old Simplicio from the 27th. This Simplicio still is in the museum. I, did, I donated. Uh, and this was my favorite. It was a smaller, not powerful. I got also a fleta that uh, broke my left hand, almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, not I'm exaggerating. Probably time for one more question. Yeah, you're up first. Uh, this might be a question that everyone in the room knows the answer to, except for me. But in a class for Alatona, um, it talks about, is it lattice for Alatona DNA? Molecular DNA. Molecular DNA. Molecular DNA. Yeah, of course. And also the nebula. Nebula. This is the nebula. Yes, in the in the sky. In nineteenth century, the astronomer Ross did the biggest telescope, and then he looked at the space. And then he discovered the, the, the Andromeda and this and that, and they are in spiral, with the Fibonacci included, like Nautilus, the, the shell, which is also developed in spiral, like the sunflower. The sunflower has two rows, one row in this sense and the other row in this one. One is 30, like one, two, three, five, eight, uh, uh, 13, so yeah, 21, so. and so on. The poem at the beginning of the score and then I did the proportion of, of the nebula I create from these three sounds going like that. And then I expanded. At the end, I don't And then I go for the first time at the end, at the very end, five seconds, eight seconds, to finish the law, which I never got before. I have a question. Oh. I have <laughs> is it, uh, no, it is, how important for a listener yeah. to know what the inspiration is in listening? In other words, should they just listen to the piece and let it speak for itself, or is it better if they read what you're trying to do with it? That's marvellous. This question is always touching every composer, I presume. I, do I have to explain why I compose this or how uh, the significant element of this, uh, or I should let them flow? This is always a, 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 a great problem, a great question with sometimes unanswered, like near Charles Ives, sometimes unanswered because if the public knows, the public shouldn't be with erudition involved. The public should be open, which is different. You don't, you don't have to be erudito. Your knowledge, 200% knowing everything in the world about music. This is better maybe, but it's also a dangerous thing because you are just analyzing constantly. That's one of the problems we have. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're to right. I say that if you are a great, your knowledge is enormous, is also dangerous because you know everything and then you are not enjoying the sound. You are not enjoying the surprise. You are, you know everything. So you are criticizing and you are not enjoying, you are suffering. This is, this is great. I mean, we're going to have to stop, but I just want to sum up. I know, just when you just sum up some of the things we've been discussing today, because so much, certainly from my point of view, is, is coming into place. Yes. I mean, we've got a composer 
who loves the notion of contrast and yeah. contradiction yeah. and ambiguity, not yes. anything being yes. particularly meaning, and the idea that you can breathe lots of different ideas into things. But the thing that came up with the question about the uh, La Espera Eternal is this whole notion of proportion. And you mentioned Fibonacci many times in the evening, yeah. and it strikes me that your, your composing um, style technique is based on the notion of ideas and almost kind of random connections. Yes. But then when you have these fragments or these blocks, the proportions between them are kind of key to making the music tick uh, and make it work. Bravo, thank you. Bravo. This is the most difficult thing. I know also the sense of timing. Composers know perfectly well. I got great friends, great genius, that they, they come back. They know what they are going to do after lunch. They come back and they start once more. And sometimes you say, this piece is too long. Even if it happens to me. This piece, I need more from this piece. This happens. Why? Because it doesn't go to the beginning. Every time I come back to, to compose one, what I know I am doing, I go back, da capo. And then I got the sense of the totality. This is my recommendation to young composers. You have a and I go on. But if I if I don't do it, I can be or boring you with it was too long or getting less sound. And this is one of the ideas, one of the problems that we have always. This, the proportions in the totally in totality or the proportions in the uh, continuity of it. Yeah. Wonderful. John, any final comments? Or? No, we could go on. We could go on forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been, I know, the time, it's uh, half past eight already. Yeah. So we must stop, unfortunately. But um, it's been an absolutely fascinating evening uh, hearing, and it's so, well, we're so grateful that you spoke so openly and honestly about your ideas, about your work, about your techniques. Um, I've certainly learned a lot just sitting here listening to you tonight, and I'm sure um, the same can be said for nearly everyone in the room. It's been the most uh, precious and um, a real honor to get this kind of insight into your way of thinking. And uh, we, I think we'd all like to thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.